Part 1, Chapter 1, No Entry to Midwich One of the luckiest accidents in my wife's life is that she happened to marry a man who was born on the 26th of September. But for that, we should both of us undoubtedly have been at home in Midwich on the night of the 26th to 27th, with consequences, which, I have never ceased to be thankful, she was spared, because it was my birthday, however, and also to some extent because I had the day before received and signed a contract with an American publisher, we set off on the morning of the 26th for London, and a mild celebration. Very pleasant, too. A few satisfactory calls, Lobster and Chablis at Wheeler's, Ustinov's latest extravaganza, a little supper. And so back to the hotel where Janet enjoyed the bathroom with that fascination which other people's plumbing always arouses in her. Next morning, a leisurely departure on the way back to Midwich. A pause in train, which is our nearest shopping town, for a few groceries, then on along the main road, through the village of Stouch, then the right hand turn on to the secondary road for, but, no. Half the road is blocked by a pole, from which dangles a notice road closed, and in the gap beside it stands a policeman who holds up his hand. So I stop. The policeman advances to the offside of the car, I recognize him as a man from train, sorry, sir, but the road is closed, you mean I'll have to go round by the Aplay Road, afraid that's closed, too, sir, but, there is the sound of a horn behind, F you wouldn't mind backing off a bit to the left, sir, rather bewildered, I do as he asks, and past us and past him goes an army three-ton lorry with khaki-clad youths leaning over the sides, revolution in Midwich? I inquire, maneuvers, he tells me. The road's impassable, not both roads surely? We live in Midwich, you know, constable, I know, sir. But there's no way there just now. If I was you. Sir, I'd go back to train, till we get it clear. Can't have parking here, cause of getting things through. Janet opens the door on her side and picks up her shopping bag. I'll walk on and you come along when the road's clear, she tells me, the constable hesitates. Then he lowers his voice, seein' as you live there, ma'am, I'll tell you, but it's confidential like. T isn't no use tryin', ma'am. Nobody can't get into Midwich, and that's a fact, we stare at him, but why on earth not, says Janet, that's just what they're tryin' to find out, ma'am. Now, if you was to go to the Eagle and train, I'll see you're informed as soon as the road's clear. Janet and I looked at one another. Well, she said to the constable, it seems very queer, but if you're quite sure we can't get through, I am that, ma'am. It's orders, too. We'll let you know, as soon as maybe. If one wanted to make a fuss, it was no good making it with him, the man was only doing his duty, and as amiably as possible. Very well, I agreed. Gayford's my name, Richard Gayford. I'll tell the Eagle to take a message for me in case I'm not there when it comes. I backed the car further until we were on the main road, and, taking his word for it that the other Midwich road was similarly closed, turned back the way we had come. Once we were the other side of Stouch Village, I pulled off the road into a field gateway. This, I said, has a very odd smell about it. Shall we cut across the fields, and see what's going on, that policeman's manner was sort of queer, too. Let's, Janet agreed, opening her door, asterisk operator, what made it the more odd was that Midwich was, almost notoriously, a place where things did not happen. Janet and I had lived there just over a year then, and found this to be almost its leading feature. Indeed, had there been posts at the entrances to, the village bearing a red triangle and below them a notice, Midwich, do not, disturb, they would have seemed not inappropriate. And why Midwich should have been singled out in preference to any one of a thousand other villages for the curious event of the 26th of September seems likely to remain a mystery forever. For consider the simple ordinariness of the place. Midwich lies roughly eight miles west-northwest of Train. 
The main road westward out of train runs through the neighboring villages of Stouch and a play, from each of which secondary roads lead to Midwich. The village itself is therefore at the apex of a road triangle which has a play and Stouch at its lower corners, its only other highway being a lane which rolls in a Chestertonian fashion some five miles to reach Hickam which is three miles north. At the heart of Midwich is a triangular green ornamented by five fine elms and a white-railed pond. The war memorial stands in the churchward corner of the green, and spaced out round the sides are the church itself. The vicarage, the inn, the smithy, the post office, Mrs. Welch's shop, and a number of cottages. Altogether, the village comprises some sixty cottages and small houses, a village hall, Kyle Manor and the Grange, the church is mostly perp. And December, but with a Norman West doorway and font. The vicarage is Georgian, the Grange Victorian, Kyle Manor has Tudor roots, with numerous later graftings. The cottages show most of the styles which have existed between the two Elizabeths, but even more recent than the two latest county council cottages are the utilitarian wings that were added to the Grange when the ministry took it over for research. The existence of Midwich has never been convincingly accounted for. It was not in a strategic position to hold a market, not even across a packway of any importance. It appears, at some unknown time, simply to have occurred, the Doomsday Survey notes it as a hamlet and it has continued as little more, for the railway age ignored it, as had the coach roads, and even the navigation canals. So far as is known, it rests upon no desirable minerals, no official I ever saw it as a likely site for an aerodrome, or a bombing range, or a battle school, only the ministry intruded, and the reconditioning of the Grange had little effect upon the village life. Midwich has, or rather, had lived and drowsed upon its good soil in Arcadian undistinction for a thousand years, and there seemed, until the late evening of the 26th of September, no reason why it should not so to do for the next millennium, too, this must not be taken, however, to mean that Midwich is altogether without history. It has had its moments. In 1931 it was the center of an untraced outbreak of foot and mouth disease. And in 1916 an off-course Zeppelin unloaded a bomb which fell in a plowed field and fortunately failed to explode. And before that it hit the headlines, well, anyway, the broadsheets, when Black Ned, a second-class highwayman, was shot on the steps of the scythe and stone by sweet Polly Parker, and although this gesture of reproof appears to have been of a more personal than social nature, she was, nevertheless, much lauded for it in the ballads of 1768, then, too, there was the sensational closure of the nearby St. Axius Abbey, and the redistribution of the brethren for reasons which have been a subject of intermittent local speculation ever since it took place, in 1493. Other events include the stabling of Cromwell's horses in the church, and a visit by William Wordsworth, who was inspired by the Abbey ruins to the production of one of his more routine commendatory sonnets. With these exceptions, however, recorded time seems to have flowed over Midwich without a ripple, nor would the inhabitants, save, perhaps, some of the youthful in their brief premarital restlessness, have it otherwise. Indeed, but for the vicar and his wife, the Zelebes at Kyle Manor, the doctor, the district nurse, ourselves, and, of course, the researchers, they had most of them lived there for numerous generations in a placid continuity which had become a right. During the day of the 26th of September, there seems to have been no trace of a foreshadow. Possibly Mrs. Brandt, the blacksmith's wife, did feel a trace of uneasiness at the sight of nine magpies in one field, as she afterwards claimed. And Miss Ogle, the postmistress, may have been perturbed on the previous night by a dream of singularly large vampire bats, but, if so, it is unfortunate that Mrs. Brandt's omens and Miss Ogle's dreams should have been so frequent as to nullify their alarm value. No other evidence has been produced to suggest that on that Monday, until late in the evening, 
Midwich was anything but normal. Just, in fact, as it had appeared to be when Janet and I set off for London. And yet, on Tuesday the 27th, asterisk operator, we locked the car, climbed the gate, and started over the field of stubble, keeping well into the hedge. At the end of that, we came to another field of stubble and bore leftwards across it. Slightly uphill. It was a big field with a good hedge on the far side and we had to go further left to find a gate we could climb. Halfway across the pasture beyond brought us to the top of the rise, and we were able to look out across Midwich, not that much of it was visible for trees, but we could see a couple of wisps of grayish smoke lazily rising, and the church spire sticking up by the elms. Also, in the middle of the next field I could see four or five cows lying down, apparently asleep. I am not a countryman, I only live there, but I remember thinking rather far back in my mind that there was something not quite right about that. Cows folded up, chewing cud, yes, commonly enough, but cows lying down fast asleep, well, no. But it did not do more at the time than give me a vague feeling of something out of true. We went on, we climbed the fence of the field where the cows were and started across that, too. A voice hallooed at us, away on the left. I looked round and made out a khaki clad figure in the middle of the next field. He was calling something unintelligible, but the way he was waving his stick was without doubt a sign for us to go back. I stopped, oh, come on. Richard. He's miles away, said Janet impatiently, and began to run on ahead. I still hesitated, looking at the figure who was now waving his stick more energetically than ever, and shouting more loudly, though no more intelligibly. I decided to follow Janet. She had perhaps twenty yards start of me by now, and then, just as I started off, she staggered, collapsed, without a sound, and lay quite still, I stopped dead. That was involuntary. If she had gone down with a twisted ankle, or had simply tripped, I should have run on, to her. But this was so sudden and so complete that for a moment I thought, idiotically, that she had been shot, the stop was only momentary. Then I went on again. Dimly, I was aware of the man away on the left still shouting, but I did not bother about him. I hurried towards her, but I did not reach her, I went out so completely that I never even saw the ground come up to hit me. Thank you for watching the video, subscribe to hear more great stories. Chapter 2 All Quiet in Midwich As I said, all was normal in Midwich on the 26th. I have looked into the matter extensively, and can tell you where practically everyone was, and what they were doing that evening. The Scythe and Stone, for instance, was entertaining its regulars in their usual numbers. Some of the younger villagers had gone to the pictures in train, mostly the same ones who had gone there the previous Monday. In the post office, Miss Ogle was knitting beside her switchboard and finding, as usual, that real-life conversation was more interesting than the wireless. Mr. Tapper, who used to be a jobbing gardener before he won something fabulous in a football pool, was in a bad temper with his prized colour television set, which had gone on the blink again in its red circuit, and was abusing it in language that had already driven his wife to bed. Lights still burnt in one or two of the new laboratories, shouldered on to the Grange, but there was nothing unusual in that. It was common for one or two researchers to conduct their mysterious pursuits late into the night. But although all was so normal, even the most ordinary-seeming day is special for someone. For instance, it was, as I have said, my birthday, so it happened that our cottage was closed and dark, and up at Kyle Manor it happened also to be the day when Miss Farrelin Zellaby put it to Mr. Allen, temporarily Second Lieutenant, Hughes, that, in practice, it takes more than two to make an engagement, that it would be a friendly gesture to tell her father about it. Allen, after some hesitation and demur, allowed himself to be persuaded into Gordon Zellaby's study to make him acquainted with the situation. He found the master of Kyle Manor spread comfortably about a large armchair, his eyes closed and his elegantly white head leaning against the chair's right wing, 
so that at first sight he appeared to have been lulled to sleep by excellently reproduced music that pervaded the room. Without speaking or opening his eyes, however, he dispelled this impression by waving his left hand at another easy chair and then putting his finger to his lips for silence. Alan tiptoed to the indicated chair and sat down. There then followed an interlude, during which all the phrases that he had summoned to the tip of his tongue drained back somewhere beyond its root, and for the next ten minutes or so he occupied himself by a survey of the room. One wall was covered from floor to ceiling by books, which broke off only to allow the door by which he had entered. More books in lower bookcases ran round most of the room, halting in places to accommodate the French windows, the chimney-piece, where flickered a pleasant though not quite necessary fire, and the record player. One of the several glass-fronted cases was devoted to the Zellaby works, in various editions and languages, with room on the bottom shelf for a few more. Above this case hung a sketch in red chalk of a handsome young man who could, after some forty years, still be seen in Gordon Zellaby. On another case, a vigorous bronze recorded the impression he had made on Epstein some twenty-five years later. A few signed portraits of other notable persons hung here and there on the walls. The space above and about the fireplace was reserved for more domestic mementos. Along with portraits of Gordon Zellaby's father, mother, brother, and two sisters, hung likenesses of Farolin and her mother, Mrs. Zellaby No. 1. A portrait of Angela, the present Mrs. Gordon Zellaby, stood upon the centrepiece and focus of the room, the large leather-topped desk where the works were written. A reminder of the works caused Alan to wonder whether his timing might not have been more propitious, for a new work was in process of gestation. This was made manifest by a certain distraitness in Mr. Zellaby at present. It always happens when he's brewing, Ferrolin had explained. Part of him seems to get lost. He goes off on long walks and can't make out where he is and rings up to be brought home and so on. It's a bit trying while it lasts, but it gets all right again once he eventually starts to write the book. While it's on, we just have to be firm with him and see he has his meals and all that. The room in general, with its comfortable chairs, convenient lights and thick carpet, struck Alan as a practical result of its owner's views on the balanced life. He recalled that in While We Last, the only one of the works he had read as yet, Zellaby had treated asceticism and overindulgence as similar evidences of maladjustment. It had been an interesting, but he thought gloomy, book. The author had not seemed to him to give proper weight to the fact that the new generation was more dynamic and rather more clear-sighted than those that had preceded it. At last the music tied itself up with a neat bow and ceased. Zellaby stopped the machine by a switch on the arm of his chair, opened his eyes and regarded Alan. I hope you don't mind, he apologised. One feels that once Bach has started his pattern, he should be allowed to finish it. Besides, he added, glancing at the playing cabinet, we still lack a code for dealing with these innovations. Is the art of the musician less worthy of respect simply because he's not present in person? What is the gracious thing? For me to defer to you, for you to defer to me, or for both of us to defer to genius? Even genius at second hand? Nobody can tell us. We shall never know. We don't seem to be good at integrating novelties with our social lives, do we? The world of the etiquette book fell to pieces at the end of the last century, and there has been no code of manners to tell us how to deal with anything invented since. Not even rules for an individualist to break, which is itself another blow at freedom. Rather a pity, don't you think? Uh, uh yes, uh, said Alan. I, uh... Oh, mind you, Mr. Zellaby continued, it is a trifled M.O. day even to perceive the existence of the problem. The true fruit of this century has little interest in coming to living terms with innovations. It just greedily grabs them all as they come along. Only when it encounters something really big does it become aware of a social problem at all. And then, rather than make concessions, it yammers for the impossible easy way out. Uninvention. Suppression. As in the matter of the bomb. Oh, uh, yes. I suppose so. What I... Mr. Zellaby perceived a lack of fervour in the response. When one is young, he said understandingly, the unconventional, the unregulated, hand-to-mouth way of life has a romantic aspect, but such, you must agree, are not the lines on which to run a complex world. Luckily, we in the West still retain the skeleton of our ethics, 
But there are signs that the old bones are finding the weight of new knowledge difficult to carry with confidence, don't you think? Alan drew breath. Recollections of previous entanglements in the web of Zellaby discourse forced him to the direct solution. Actually, sir, it was on quite another matter I wanted to see you, he said. When Zellaby noticed the interruptions of his audible reflections, he was accustomed to take them in mild good part. He now postponed further contemplation of the ethical skeleton to inquire, Oh, but of course, my dear fellow, by all means, uh, what is it? It's that, well, it's about Farallon, sir. Farallon? Oh, yes. I'm afraid she's gone up to London for a couple of days to see her mother. She'll be back tomorrow. Uh, it was today she came back, Mr. Sellaby. Really? exclaimed Sellaby. He thought it over. Oh, yes, you're quite right. She was here for dinner. Well, you both were, he said triumphantly. Yes, said Alan, and holding his chance with determination, he ploughed ahead with his news, unhappily conscious that not one stone of his prepared phrases remained upon another, but getting through it somehow. Zellaby listened patiently until Alan finally stumbled to a conclusion with, So I do hope, sir, that you will have no objection to our becoming officially engaged. And at that his eyes widened slightly. My dear fellow, you overestimate my position. Farallon is a sensible girl, and I have no doubt whatever that by this time she and her mother know all about you, and have together reached a well-considered decision. But I've never even met Mrs. Helder. Alan objected. Well, if you had, you would have a better grasp of the situation. Jane is a great organiser, Mr. Zellaby told him, regarding one of the pictures on the mantel with benevolence. He got up. Well, now, you have performed your part very creditably, so I, too, must behave as Farrelling considers proper. Would you care to assemble the company while I fetch the bottle? A few minutes with his wife, his daughter, and his prospective son-in-law grouped about him. He lifted his glass. Let us now drink, announced Zellaby, to the adjunction of fond spirits. It is true that the institution of marriage, as it is proclaimed by church and state, displays a depressingly mechanistic attitude of mind towards partnership, one not unlike, in fact, that of Noah. The human spirit, however, is tough, and it quite often happens that love is able to survive this coarse institutional thumbing. Let us hope, therefore, Daddy, Ferlin broke in. It's after ten, and Alan has to get back to camp in time, or he'll be cashiered or something. All you really have to say is, long life and happiness to you both. Oh, said Mr. Zellaby. Well, you saw that's enough? Seems very brief. However, if you think it's suitable, then I say it, my dear. Most wholeheartedly, I say it. He did. Alan set down his empty glass. I'm afraid what Ferrolin said was right, sir. I shall have to leave now he said. Celebi nodded sympathetically. It must be a trying time for you. How much longer will they keep you? Alan said he hoped to be free of the army in about three months. Zellaby nodded again. I expect the experience will turn out to have value. Sometimes I regret the lack of it myself. Too young for one war, tethered to a desk in the Ministry of Information in the next. Something more active would have been preferable. Well, good night, my dear fellow. It's... he broke off, struck by a sudden thought. Dear me, I know we all call you Alan, but I don't believe I know your other name. Perhaps we ought to have that in order. Alan told him, and they shook hands again. As he emerged into the hall with Ferrolin, he noticed the clock. I say, I'll have to step on it. See you tomorrow, darling. Six o'clock. Good night, my sweet. They kissed fervently, but briefly, in the doorway and he broke away down the steps, bounding towards the small red car parked on the drive. The engine started and roared. He gave a final wave, and, with a spurt of gravel from the rear wheels, dashed away. Ferrolin watched the rear lights dwindle and vanish. She stood listening until the erstwhile roar became a distant hum, and then closed the front door. On her way back to the study, she noticed that the hall clock now showed 10.15. Still, then, at 10.15... Nothing in Midwich was abnormal. With the departure of Alan's car, peace was able to settle down again over a community which was, by and large, engaged in winding up an uneventful day in expectation of a no less uneventful morrow. 
Many cottage windows still threw yellow beams into the mild evening, where they glistered in the dampness of an earlier shower. The occasional surges of voices and laughter which swept the place were not local. They originated with a well-handled studio audience miles away, and several days ago, and formed merely a background against which most of the village was preparing for bed. Many of the very old and very young had gone there already, and wives were now filling their own hot water bottles. The last customers to be persuaded out of the scythe and stone had lingered for a few minutes to get their night eyes, and gone their ways, and by ten-fifteen all but one Alfred Waite and a certain Harry Crankhart, who were still engaged in argument about fertilisers, had reached their homes. Only one event of the day still impended. The passage of the bus that would be bringing the more dashing spirits back from their evening in train. With that over, Midwich could finally settle down for the night. In the vicarage, at ten-fifteen, Miss Polly Rushton was thinking that if only she had gone to bed half an hour ago, she could be enjoying the book that now lay neglected on her knees, and how much pleasanter that would be than listening to the present contest between her uncle and aunt. For on one side of the room, Uncle Hubert, the Reverend Hubert Leabody, was attempting to listen to a third programme disquisition on the pre conception of the Oedipus complex, while on the other, Aunt Dora was telephoning. Mr. Leabody, determined that scholarship should not be submerged by piffle, had already made two advances in volume, and still had forty-five degrees of knob-turning in reserve. He could not be blamed for failing to guess that what was striking him as a particularly nugatory exchange of feminine concerns could turn out to be of importance. No one else would have guessed it either. The call was from South Kensington, London, where a Mrs. Cluey was seeking the support of her lifelong friend Mrs. Leabody. By 10.16 she had reached the colonel of the matter. Now tell me, Dora, and mind, I, I do want your honest opinion on this. Do you think that in Cathy's case it should be white satin or white brocade? Mrs. Leabody stalled. Clearly this was a matter where the word honest was relative, and it was inconsiderate of Mrs. Cluey, to say the least, to phrase her question with no perceptible bias. Probably satin, thought Mrs. Leabody, but she hesitated to risk the friendship of years on a guess. She tried for a lead. Of course, for a very young bride. But then one wouldn't call Cathy such a very young bride, perhaps. Not very young, agreed Mrs. Cluey, and waited. Mrs. Leabody dratted her friend's importunity, and also her husband's wireless programme, which made thinking and finesse difficult. Well, she said at last, both can look charming, of course, but for Cathy I really think— At which point her voice abruptly stopped. Far away in South Kensington, Mrs. Cluey joggled the rest impatiently, and looked at her watch. Presently she pressed the bar down for a moment, and then dialed O. I wish to make a complaint, she said. I have just been cut off in the middle of a most important conversation. The exchange told her it would try to reconnect her. A few minutes later it confessed failure. Most inefficient, said Mrs. Cluey. I shall put in a written complaint. I refuse to pay for a minute more than we had. Indeed, I don't really see why I should pay for that, in the circumstances. We were cut off at ten-seventeen, exactly. The man at the exchange responded with formal tact, and made a note of the time, for reference. Twenty-two-seventeen hours. 26th of September. Thank you for watching the video. Subscribe to hear more great stories. Chapter 3 Midwich Rests. From 1017 that night, information about Midwich becomes episodic. Its telephones remained dead. The bus that should have passed through it failed to reach Stouch, and a truck that went to look for the bus did not return. A notification from the RAF was received in train of some unidentified flying object, not, repeat not, a service machine, detected by radar in the Midwich area, possibly making a forced landing. Someone in Opley reported a house on fire in Midwich, with apparently nothing being done about it. The train fire appliance turned out and thereafter failed to make any reports. The train police dispatched a car to find out what had happened to the fire engine, and that too vanished into silence. Opley reported a second fire, and still seemingly nothing being done. Constable Gobby and Stouch was rung up and sent off on his bicycle to Midwich, and no more was heard of him, either. The dawn of the 27th was an affair of slatternly rags, 
soaking in a dishwater sky with a grey light weakly filtering through. Nevertheless, in Opley and in Stouch, cocks crowed and other birds welcomed it more melodiously. In Midwich, however, no birds sang. In Opley and Stouch, too, as in other places, hands were soon reaching out to silence alarm clocks, but in Midwich the clocks rattled on till they ran down. In other villages, sleepy-eyed men left their cottages and encountered their workmates with sleepy good mornings. In Midwich, no one encountered anyone. For Midwich lay entranced. While the rest of the world began to fill the day with clamour, Midwich slept on. Its men and women, its horses, cows and sheep, its pigs, its poultry, its larks, moles and mice all lay still. There was a pocket of silence in Midwich broken only by the frewing of the leaves, the chiming of the church clock, and the gurgle of the opal as it slid over the weir beside the mill. And while the dawn was still a poor, weak thing, an olive-green van with the words Post Office Telephones just discernible upon it, set out from train with the object of putting the rest of the world into touch with Midwich again. In Stouch it paused at the village call box to inquire whether Midwich had yet shown any signs of life. Midwich had not. It was still as deeply incommunicado as it had been since twenty-two seventeen hours. The van restarted and rattled on through the uncertainly gathering daylight. Core, said the lineman to his driver companion. Core, that there Miss Ogle ain't half going to cop herself a basin full of Her Majesty's displeasure over this little lot. I don't get it, complained the driver. If you'd asked me, I'd said the old girl was always listening when there was anyone on the blower day or night. Just goes to show, he added vaguely. A little out of Stouch, the van swung sharply to the right and bounced along the by-road to Midwich for half a mile or so. Then it rounded a corner to encounter a situation which called for all the driver's presence of mind. He had a sudden view of a fire engine, half heeled over, with its near side wheels in the ditch, and a black saloon car which had climbed halfway up the bank on the other side a few yards further on, with a man on a bicycle lying half in the ditch behind it. He pulled hard over, attempting an S-turn which would avoid both vehicles, but before he could complete it, his own van ran onto the narrow verge, bumped along for a few more yards, then ploughed to a stop, with its side in the hedge. Half an hour later, the first bus of the day, proceeding at a light-hearted speed, since it never had a passenger before it picked up the Midwich children for school in Opley, rattled round the same corner to jam itself neatly into the gap between fire engine and the van, and block the road completely. On Midwich's other road, that connecting it with Opley, a similar tangle of vehicles gave at first sight the impression that the highway had, overnight, become a dump. And on that side the mail van was the first vehicle to stop without becoming involved. One of its occupants got out and walked forward to investigate the disorder. He was just approaching the rear of the stationary bus when, without any warning, he quietly folded up and dropped to the ground. The driver's jaw fell open, and he stared. Then, looking beyond his fallen companion, he saw the heads of some of the bus passengers, all quite motionless. He reversed hastily, turned, and made for Opley and the nearest telephone. Meanwhile, the similar state of affairs on the Stouch side had been discovered by the driver of a baker's van, and twenty minutes later almost identical action was taking place on both the approaches to Midwich. Ambulances swept up with something of the air of mechanised Galahads. Their rear doors opened. Uniformed men emerged, fastened their tunic buttons, and providently pinching the embers from half-smoked cigarettes. They surveyed the pile-ups in a knowledgeable, confidence-inspiring way, unrolled stretchers, and prepared to advance. On the Opley Road, the two leading bearers approached the prone postman competently, but then, as the one in the lead drew level with the body, he wilted, sagged, and subsided across the last casualty's legs. The hind bearer goggled. Out of a babble behind him, his ears picked up the words, GAS! He dropped the stretcher handles as if they had turned hot, and stepped hastily back. There was a pause for consultation. Presently the ambulance driver delivered a verdict, shaking his head. Not our kind of job, he said, with the air of one recalling a useful union decision. More like the fire chaps, pigeon, I'd say. The armies, I reckon, said the bearer. Gas masks, not just smoke masks, is what's wanted here. Thank you for watching the video. Subscribe to hear more great stories.
Chapter 4 Operation Midwich About the time that Janet and I were approaching train, Lieutenant Alan Hughes was standing side by side with leading fireman Norris on the Opley Road. They were watching while a fireman grappled at the fallen ambulance man with a long ceiling hook. Presently the hook lodged and began to haul him in. The body was dragged across a yard and a half of tarmac, and then sat up abruptly and swore. It seemed to Alan that he had never heard more beautiful language. Already the acute anxiety with which he had arrived on the scene had been allayed by the discovery that the victims of whatever it was were quietly, but quite definitely, breathing as they lay there. Now it was established that one, at least, of them showed no visible ill effects of quite ninety minutes' experience of it. Good, said Alan. If he's all right, it looks as if the rest may be, though it doesn't get as much nearer to knowing what it is. The next to be hooked and pulled out was the postman. He had been there somewhat longer than the ambulance man, but his recovery was every bit as spontaneous and satisfactory. The line seems to be quite sharp and stationary, Alan added. Who ever heard of a perfectly stationary gas? And with a light wind blowing, too. Doesn't make sense. Can't be droplet stuff evaporating off the ground, either, said the leading farman. Kind of hits them like a hammer. Never heard of a droplet one like that, did you? Alan shook his head. Besides, he agreed, anything really volatile would have cleared by now. What's more, it wouldn't have vaporized last night and caught the bus and the rest. The bus was due in Midwich at 10.25, and I came over this bit of road myself only a few minutes before that. There wasn't anything wrong with it then. In fact, that must be the bus I met just running into Opley. I wonder how far it stretches, mused the leading fireman. Must be fairly wide, or we'd see things what were trying to come this way. They continued to gaze in perplexity towards Midwich. Beyond the vehicles, the road continued with a clear, innocent-looking, slightly shining surface to the next turn, just like any other road almost dry after a shower. Now that the morning mist had lifted, it was possible to see the tower of Midwich Church jutting above the hedges. When one disregarded the immediate foreground, the prospect was the very negation of mystery. The fireman, assisted by Alan's squad, continued to drag out the forms within easy reach. Their experience seemed to leave no impression on the victims. Each one, on coming clear, sat up alertly and maintained with obvious truth that he needed no help from the ambulance men. The next job was to clear an inverted tractor out of the way so that the further vehicles and their occupants could be pulled clear. Alan left his sergeant and the leading fireman directing the work and climbed over a stile. The field path beyond climbed a small rise and gave him a better view of the Midwich terrain. He was able to see several roofs, including those of Kyle Manor and the Grange, also the topmost stones of the Abbey ruins and two drifts of grey smoke. A placid scene. But a few further yards brought him to a point where he could see four sheep lying motionless in a field. The sight troubled him, not because he now thought it likely that any real harm had come to the sheep, but because it indicated that the barrier zone was wider than he had hoped. He contemplated the creatures and the landscape beyond, and noticed two cows on their side still further away. He watched them for a minute or two, to make sure there was no movement, and then turned and walked thoughtfully back to the road. Sergeant Decker, he called. The sergeant came over and saluted. Sergeant, said Alan, I want you to get hold of a canary, in a cage, of course. The sergeant blinked. Uh, a canary, sir? he asked uneasily. Well, I suppose a budgegar would do as well. There ought to be some in Opley. You'd better take the jeep and tell the owner there'll be compensation, if necessary. I, uh, cut along now, Sergeant. I want that bird here as soon as you can manage it. Uh, very good, sir. Uh, a canary, the sergeant added to make sure. Yes, said Alan. I became aware that I was slithering along the ground, face down. Very odd. One moment I was hurrying towards Janet, then, with no interval at all, this. The motion stopped. I sat up to find myself surrounded by a collection of people. There was a fireman, engaged in disentangling a murderous-looking hook from my clothing, a St. John ambulance man regarding me with a professionally hopeful eye, 
a very young private carrying a pail of whitewash, another holding a map, and an equally young corporal armed with a birdcage on the end of a long pole. Also an unencumbered officer. In addition to this somewhat surrealistic collection, there was Janet, still lying where she had fallen. I got to my feet just as the fireman, having freed his hook, reached it towards her and caught the belt of her Macintosh. He began to pull, and of course the belt broke, so he reached it across her and began to roll her towards us. At the second time over, she sat up, looking disarranged and indignant. Feeling all right, Mr. Gayford? asked a voice beside me. I looked round and recognised the officer as Alan Hughes, whom we had met at the Zellabies a couple of times. Yes, I said, but what's going on here? He disregarded that for the moment and helped Janet to her feet. Then he turned to the corporal. I'd better get back to the road. Just carry on with this, corporal. Yes, sir, said the corporal. He lowered his pole from the vertical and, with the cage still dangling at its end, thrust it forward tentatively. The bird fell off its perch and lay on the sanded floor of the cage. The corporal withdrew the cage. The bird gave a slightly indignant tweet and hopped back on its perch. One watching private stepped forward with his bucket and daubed a little whitewash on the grass. The other made a mark on his map. The party then moved along a dozen yards or so and repeated the performance. This time it was Janet who inquired what on earth was happening. Alan explained as much as he knew and added, There's obviously no chance of getting into the place while this lasts. Much or best course would be to make for train and wait there for the all clear. We looked after the corporal's party just in time to see the bird fall off its perch once more and then across the innocent fields to Midwich. After our experience, there did not appear to be any useful alternative. Janet nodded. So we thanked young Hughes and presently parted from him to make our way back to the car. At the Eagle, Janet insisted that we should book a room for the night just in case, and then went up to it. I gravitated to the bar. The place was quite unusually full for noon and almost entirely of strangers. The majority of them were talking somewhat histrionically in small groups or pairs, though a few individuals were drinking privately and thoughtfully. I wormed my way to the counter with some difficulty, and as I was worming it back again, drink in hand, a voice at my shoulder said, Now, what on earth would you be doing in this lot, Richard? The voice was familiar, and so when I looked round was the face, though it took me a second or two to place it. There was not only the veil of years to be drawn aside, but a military cap had to be juggled into the place of the present tweed, but when this had been done, I was delighted. My dear Bernard, I exclaimed, this is wonderful. Come along out of this mob. And I seized his arm and towed him into the lounge. The sight of him made me feel young again, took me back to the beaches, the Ardennes, the Reichswald and the Rhine. It was a good meeting. I sent the waiter for more drinks. It took about half an hour for the first ebullition to level out. When it did, you never answered my first question he reminded me, looking at me carefully. I had no idea you'd gone in for that sort of thing. What sort of thing? I inquired. He lifted his head slightly towards the bar. The press, he explained. Oh, is that it? I was wondering why the invasion. One eyebrow descended a little. Well, if you're not part of it, what are you? He said. I just live in these parts, I told him. Just at that moment, Janet came into the lounge, and I introduced him. Janet, dear, this is Bernard Westcott. He used to be Captain Westcott when we were together, but I know he became a major, and now... Colonel, admitted Bernard, and greeted her charmingly. I'm so glad, Janet told him. I've heard a lot about you. I know one says that, but this time it happens to be true. She invited him to lunch with us, but he said that he had business to attend to and was already overdue. His tone of regret was genuine enough for her to say, Well, dinner then. At home, if we can get there, but here, if we are still exiled. At home? queried Bernard. We're in Midwich, she explained. It's about eight miles away. Bernard's manner changed slightly. You live in Midwich? he inquired, looking from her to me. Have you been there long? About a year, I told him. We'd normally be there now, but... I explained how we came to be stranded at the Eagle. He thought for some moments after I finished, and then seemed to come to a decision. He turned to Janet. Mrs. Gayford, I wonder if you would excuse me if I were to take your husband along with me. It's this Midwich business that has brought me here. 
I think he might be able to help us, if he's willing. To find out what happened, you mean? Janet asked. Well, let's say in connection with it, what do you think? He added to me. Well, if I can, of course, though I don't see... Who is us? I inquired. I'll explain as we go, he told me. I really ought to have been there an hour ago. I'd not drag him off like this if it weren't important, Mrs. Gayford. You'll be all right on your own here? Janet assured him that the Eagle was a safe place, and we rose. Just one thing, he added before we left. Don't let any of those fellows in the bar pester you. Get them slung out if they try. They're all a bit peevish, since they've learned that their editors won't be touching this midwitch business. Not a word to any of them. Tell you more about it later. Very well. Agog, but silent. That's me. Janet agreed as we left. HQ had been established a little back from the affected area on the Opley Road. At the police block, Bernard produced a pass which earned him a salute from the constable on duty, and we passed through without further trouble. A very young three-pipper sitting forlornly in a tent brightened up at our arrival, and decided that as Colonel Latcher was out inspecting the lines, it was his duty to put us in the picture. The caged birds had now, it seemed, finished their job, and been returned to their doting but reluctantly public-spirited owners. We'll probably have protests from the RSPCA, as well as claims for damages when they contract croup or something, said the captain. But here's the result. And he produced a large-scale map showing a perfect circle, almost two miles in diameter, with Midwich Church lying somewhat south and a little east of its centre. That's it he explained. As far as we can tell, it is a circle, not just a belt. We've got an OP on Opley Church Tower, and no movement in the area has been observed. And there are a couple of chaps lying in the road outside the pub who haven't moved either. As to what it is, we're not much further. We've established that it is static, invisible, odourless, non-registering on radar, non-echoing on sound, immediate in effect on at least mammals, birds, reptiles, and insects, and apparently has no after-effects, at least no direct effects, though naturally the people in the bus and the others who were in it for some time are feeling roguish from exposure. But that's about as far as we go. Frankly, as to what it really is, we haven't a clue yet. Bernard asked him a few questions, which elicited little more, and then we made our way in search of Colonel Latcher. We found him, after a while, in company with an older man who turned out to be the chief constable of Winshire. Both of them, with some lesser lights and attendants, were standing on a slight rise regarding the terrain. Their grouping suggested an eighteenth-century engraving of generals watching a battle that was not going too well, only there was no visible battle. Bernard introduced himself and me. The colonel regarded him intently. Ah! He said, Ah, oh, yes, yeah, so you're the chap on the phone who told me that this had to be kept quiet. Before Bernard could reply, the chief constable came in. Kept quiet? Kept quiet, indeed? A two-mile circle of country completely blanketed by this thing, and you'd like it kept quiet? That was the instruction, said Bernard. The security. But how the devil do they think... Colonel Latcher cut in, heading him off. Well, we've, we've done our best to put it around as a surprise tactical exercise. Bit thin, but it makes something to say. Had to say something. Trouble is, for all we know, it may be some little trick of our own gone wrong. So much damn secrecy nowadays that nobody knows anything. Don't know what the other chap has. Don't even know what you may have to use yourself. All these scientist fellows in back rooms ruining the profession. Can't keep up with what you don't know. Soldiering will soon be nothing but wizards and wires. The news agencies are onto it already, grumbled the chief constable. We've headed some of them off, but you know what they are. They'll be sneaking around some way, pushing their noses into it and having to be pulled out. And how are we going to keep them quiet? That at least needn't worry you much, Bernard told him. There's been a Home Office advice on this already. Very sore they are, but I think it will hold. It really depends on whether it turns out to have enough sensation in it to make trouble worthwhile. Hmm, said the Colonel, looking out across the somnolent scene again. And I suppose that depends on whether, from a newspaper point of view, the Sleeping Beauty would be a sensation or a bore. 
Quite an assortment of people kept on turning up in the course of the next hour or two, all apparently representing the interests of various departments, civil and military. A larger tent was erected beside the Opley Road, and in it a conference was called for 1630. Colonel Latcher led off with a review of the situation. It did not take long. Just as he was concluding it, a group captain arrived. He marched in with a malevolent air and slapped a large photograph down onto the table in front of the colonel. There you are, gentlemen, he said grimly. That cost two good men in one good aircraft, and we were lucky not to lose another. I hope it was worth it. We crowded round to study the photograph and compare it with the map. Uh, what's that? asked a major of intelligence, pointing. The object he indicated showed as a pale oval outline with a shape, judging by the shadows, not unlike the inverted bowl of a spoon. The chief constable bent down, peering more closely. I can't imagine, he admitted. Looks as if it might be some unusual kind of building, only it can't be. I was round by the Abbey Ruins myself less than a week ago, and there was no sign of anything there then. Besides, that's British Heritage Association property. They don't build, they just prop things up. One of the others looked from the photograph to the map and back again. Well, whatever it is, it's in just about the mathematical centre of the trouble, he pointed out. If it wasn't there a few days ago, it must be something that's landed there. Unless it could be a rick with a very bleached cover, someone suggested. The chief constable snorted. Look at the scale, man, and the shape. It'd have to be the size of a dozen ricks at least. Then what the devil is it? inquired the major. One after another, we studied it through the magnifier. You couldn't get a lower altitude picture, suggested the major. Try and that was how we lost the aircraft, the group captain told him curtly. How far up does the what's it to this affected area extend? Someone asked. The group captain shrugged. You could only find that out by flying into it, he said. This, he added, tapping the photograph, was taken at ten thousand. The crew noticed no effect there. Colonel Latcher cleared his throat. <clears throat> Two of my officers suggest that the area may be hemispherical in form, he remarked. So it may, agreed the group captain, or it may be rhomboidal, or dodecahedral. I gather, said the colonel mildly, that they observed birds flying into it, getting a fix on them at the moment they became affected. Uh, they claim to have established that the edge of the zone does not extend vertically like a wall, that it definitely is not a cylinder, in fact. The sides contract slightly. Uh, from that, they argue, that it must be either domed or conical. They say their evidence favours a hemisphere, but they have had to work on too small a segment of too large an arc, to be certain. Well, that's the first contribution we've had for some time, acknowledged the group captain. He pondered. If they're right about a hemisphere, uh, that should give it a ceiling of about five thousand over the centre. I suppose they didn't have any helpful ideas on how we establish that without losing another aircraft. Well, as a matter of fact, Colonel Latcher said diffidently, uh, one of them did. He suggested that perhaps a helicopter dangling a canary in a cage on a few hundred feet of line and slowly reducing height. Well, I know it sounds a bit... Uh... No, said the group captain. It's an idea. Sounds like the same fellow who got the parameter taped. It is, Colonel Latcher nodded. Quite a lion of his own in ornithological warfare, commented the group captain. I think perhaps we can improve on the canary, but we're grateful for the idea. A bit too late for it today. I'll lay it on for early tomorrow with pictures from the lowest safe altitude while there's a good crosslight. The intelligence major emerged from silence. Bombs, I think he said reflectively. Fragmentation, perhaps. Bombs? asked the group captain with raised eyebrows. Wouldn't do any harm to have some handy. Never know what these Ivans are up to. Might be a good idea to have a wham at it anyway. Stop it getting away. Knock it out so that we can have a proper look at it. Bit drastic at this stage, suggested the chief constable. I mean, wouldn't it be better to take it intact, if possible? Probably, agreed the Major, but meanwhile we are just allowing it to go on doing whatever it came to do, while it holds us off with whatever it is. Well, I don't see what it could have come to do in Midwich, another officer put in. Therefore I imagine that it force-landed and is using this screen to prevent interference while it makes repairs. Or oh, there's the Grange, someone said tentatively. 
In either case, the sooner we get authority to disable it further, the better, said the Major. It had no business over our territory anyway. Real point is, of course, that it mustn't get away. Much too interesting. Apart from the thing itself, that screen effect could be very useful indeed. I shall recommend taking any action necessary to secure it. Intact, if possible, but damaged, if necessary. There was considerable discussion, but it came to little, since almost everyone present seemed to hold no more than a watching and reporting brief. The only decisions I can recall were that parachute flares would be dropped every hour for observation purposes, and that the helicopter would attempt to get more informative photographs in the morning. Beyond that, nothing definite had been achieved when the conference broke up. I did not see why I had been taken along there at all, or, for that matter, why Bernard had been there, for he had not made a single contribution to the conference. As we drove back, I asked him, Is it out of order for me to inquire where you come into this? Not altogether. I have a professional interest. The Grange? I suggested. Yes, the Grange comes within my scope, and naturally anything untoward in its neighbourhood interests us. This one might call very untoward, don't you think? Us, I had already gathered from his self-introduction before the conference, could be either military intelligence in general, or his particular department of it. I thought, I said, that the special branch looked after that kind of thing. There are various angles, he said vaguely, and changed the subject. We managed to get him a room at the Eagle, and the three of us dined together. I had hoped that after dinner he might make good his promise to explain later, but though we talked of a number of things, including Midwich, he was clearly avoiding any more mention of his professional interest in it. But for all that it was a good evening that left me wondering how one can be so careless as to let some people drift out of one's life. Twice in the course of the evening I rang up the train police to inquire whether there had been any change in the Midwich situation, and both times they reported that it was quite unaltered. After the second, we decided it was no good waiting up, and after a final round, we retired. A nice man, said Janet, as our door closed. I was afraid it might be old warriors together, which is so boring for wives, but he didn't let it be a bit like that. Why did he take you along this afternoon? That's what's puzzling me, I confessed. He seemed to have second thoughts and become more reserved altogether once we actually got close to it. It really is very queer, Janet said as if the whole thing had just struck her afresh. Didn't he have anything at all to say about what it is? Neither he nor any of the rest of them, I assured her. About the one thing they've learned is what we could tell them, that you don't know when it hits you, and there's no sign afterwards that it did. And that at least is encouraging. Let's hope that no one in the village comes to any more harm than we did, she said. While we were still sleeping on the morning of the 28th, a Met officer gave it as his opinion that ground mist in Midwich would clear early, and a crew of two boarded a helicopter. A wire cage containing a pair of lively but perplexed ferrets was handed in after them. Presently the machine took off and wimmered noisily upwards. They reckon, remarked the pilot, that six thousand will be dead safe, so we'll try at seven thou for luck. If that's okay, we'll bring her down slowly. The observer settled his gear and occupied himself with teasing the ferrets until the pilot told him, Right, you can lower away now, and we'll make the trial crossing at seven. The cage went through the door. The observer let three hundred feet of line unreal. The machine came round, and the pilot informed ground that he was about to make a preliminary run over Midwich. The observer lay on the floor, observing the ferrets through glasses. They were doing fine at present, clambering with non-stop sinuousness all around and over one another, he took the glasses off them for a moment and turned towards the village ahead. Then, Oi, skipper, he said. Hmm? That thing we're supposed to photograph by the abbey. What about it? Well, either it was a mirage or it's flipped off, said the observer. Thank you for watching the video. Subscribe to hear more great stories. Chapter 5 Midwich River Viscuit at the same moment that the observer made his discovery, the picket at the Stouch Midwich Road was carrying out its routine test. The sergeant in charge threw a lump of sugar across the white line that had been drawn across the road, and watched while the dog, on its long lead, dashed after it. The dog snapped up the sugar and crunched it. The sergeant regarded the dog carefully for a moment and walked close to the line himself. 
He hesitated there, and then stepped across it. Nothing happened. With increasing confidence, he took a few more paces. Half a dozen rooks cawed as they passed over his head. He watched them flap steadily away over Midwich. Here, you there, signals! He called. Inform HQ Opley. Affected area reduced and believed clear. We'll confirm after further tests. A few minutes later, in Kyle Manor, Gordon Zellaby had stirred with difficulty and given out a sound like a half groan. Presently, he realized that he was lying on the floor. Also, that the room, which had been brightly lit and warm, perhaps a trifle overwarm a moment ago, was now dark and clammily cold. He shivered. He did not think he had ever felt quite so cold. It went right through, so that every fibre ached with it. There was a sound in the darkness of someone else stirring. Ferlin's voice said, shakily, "What's happened, Daddy? Angela, where are you?" Zellaby moved an aching and reluctant jaw to say, "I'm here, nearly frozen." Angela, my dear, just here, Gordon," said her voice unsteadily, close behind him. He put out a hand which encountered something, but his fingers were too numbed to tell him what it was. There was a sound of movement across the room. Gosh, I'm stiff. Oh, 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 oh dear," complained Ferlin's voice. Oh, oh, oh! I don't believe these are my legs at all. She stopped moving for a moment. What's that rattling noise? My teeth, I think. Think," said Zellaby with an effort. There was more movement, followed by a stumbling sound, then a clatter of curtain rings, and the room was revealed in a grey light. Zellaby's eyes went to the grate. He stared at it in disbelief. A moment ago, he had put a new log on the fire. Now, there was nothing there but a few ashes. Angela, sitting up on the carpet a yard away from him, and Ferelin by the window, were both staring at the grate too. What on earth? Began Ferelin. The sh sh champagne, suggested Zellaby. Oh, really, Daddy? Against the protest of every joint, Zellaby tried to get up. He found it too painful and decided to stay where he was for a bit. Ferelin crossed unsteadily to the fireplace. She reached a hand towards it and stood there shivering. I think it's dead," she said. She tried to pick up the Times from the chair, but her fingers were too numb to hold it. She looked at it miserably and then managed to scramble it between her stiff hands and stuff it into the grate. Still using both hands, she succeeded in lifting some of the smaller bits of wood from the basket and dropping them onto the paper. Frustration with the matches almost made her weep. My fingers. <laughs> Won't," she wailed miserably. In her efforts, she spilt the matches on the hearth. Somehow, she managed to light one by rubbing the box on them. It caught another. She pushed them all closer to the paper, bulging out of the grate. Presently, it caught too, and the flame blossomed up like a wonderful flower. Angela got up and staggered stiffly closer. Zellaby made his approach on all fours. The wood began to crackle. They crouched towards it. Greedy for warmth, the numbness in their outstretched fingers began to give way to a tingling. After a while, a Zellaby spirit began to show signs of revival. Odd," he remarked through teeth that still showed a tendency to chatter. "Odd that I should have to live to my present age before appreciating the underlying soundness of fire worship." On both the Opley and Stout roads, there was a great starting up and warming of engines. Presently, two streams of ambulances, fire appliances, police cars, jeeps, and military trucks started to converge on Midwich. They met at the green. The civilian transport pulled up, and its occupants piled out. The military trucks, for the most part, headed for Hickham Lane, bound for the Abbey. An exception to both categories was a small red car that turned off by itself and went bouncing up the drive of Kyle Manor to stop in grooves of gravel by the front door. Alan Hughes burst into the Zellaby study, pulled Ferelin out of the huddle by the fire, and clutched her firmly. "Darling," he exclaimed, still breathing hard. "Darling, are you all right?" "Darling," responded Ferelin, rather as if it were an answer. After a considerate interval, Gordon Zellaby remarked, 
We also are all right, we believe, though bewildered. Uh, we are also somewhat chilled. Uh, d do you think... Alan seemed to become aware of them for the first time. The... He began, and then broke off as the lights came on. Kudo, he said. Hot jinx in a jiffy. And departed, towing Farrellin after him. Hot jinx in a jiffy, murmured Zellaby. Such music in a simple phrase. And so, when we came down to breakfast, eight miles away, it was to be greeted with the news that Colonel Westcott had gone out a couple of hours before, and that Midwich was as near awake again as was natural to it. Thank you for watching the video. Subscribe to hear more great stories. Chapter 6 Midwich Settles Down There was still a police picket on the Stouch Road, but as residents of Midwich we passed through promptly to drive on through a scene which looked much as usual, and reach our cottage without further hindrance. We had wondered more than once what state of affairs we might find there, but there proved to have been no need for alarm. The cottage was intact and exactly as we had left it. We went in and resettled ourselves just as we had intended on the previous day, with no inconvenience except that the milk in the refrigerator had gone off, on account of the cut in the electricity supply. Indeed, within half an hour of returning, the happenings of the previous day were beginning to seem unreal. And when we went out and talked to our neighbours, we found that for those who had actually been involved, the feeling of unreality was even more pronounced. Nor was that surprising, for, as Mr. Zellaby pointed out, their knowledge of the affair was limited to an awareness that they had failed to go to bed one night and had awakened, feeling extremely cold, one morning. The rest was a matter of hearsay. One had to believe that they had, during the interval, missed a day, for it was improbable that the rest of the world could be collectively mistaken. But speaking for himself, it had not even been an interesting experience, since the prime requisite of interest was, after all, consciousness. He therefore proposed to disregard the whole matter, and do his best to forget that he had been cheated out of one of the days which he found to be passing, in proper sequence, far too quickly. Such a dismissal turned out for a time to be surprisingly easy, for it is doubtful whether the affair, even had it not lain beneath the intimidating muzzles of the Official Secrets Act, could at this stage have made a really useful newspaper sensation. As a dish, it had a number of promising aromas, but it proved short on substance. There were in all eleven casualties, and something might have been made of them, but even they lacked the details to excite a blasé readership, and the stories of the survivors were woefully undramatic, for they had nothing to tell but their recollections of a cold awakening. We were able, therefore, to assess our losses, dress our wounds, and generally readjust ourselves from the experience which afterwards became known as the day out, with a quite unexpected degree of privacy. Of our eleven fatalities, Mr. William Trunk, a farmhand, his wife and their small son, had perished when their cottage burnt down. An elderly couple called Stagfield had been lost in the other house that caught fire. Another farmhand, Herbert Flagg, had been discovered dead from exposure in close, and not easily explained, proximity to the cottage occupied by Mrs. Harriman, whose husband was at work in his bakery at the time. Harry Crankhart, one of the two men whom the Opley Church Tower observers had been able to see lying in front of the scythe and stone, had also been found dead from exposure. The other four were all elderly persons, in whom neither sulphurs nor their mycetes had been able to check the progress of pneumonia. Mr. Leabody preached a thanksgiving sermon on behalf of the rest of us at an unusually well-attended service the following Sunday, and with that and his conduct of the last of the funerals, the dreamlike quality of the whole affair became established. It is true that for a week or so there were a few soldiers about, and there was quite a deal of coming and going in official cars, but the centre of this interest did not lie within the village itself, and so disturbed it little. The visible focus of attention was close to the abbey ruins, where a guard was posted to protect a large dent in the ground, which certainly looked as if something massive had rested there for a while. Engineers had measured this phenomenon, made sketches and taken photographs of it. Technicians of various kinds had then tramped back and forth across it, carrying mine detectors, Geiger counters, and other subtle gear. Then, abruptly, the military lost all interest in it and withdrew. Investigations at the Grange went on a little longer, and among those occupied with them was Bernard Westcott. He dropped in to see us several times, but he told us nothing of what was going on and we asked no details. 
We knew no more than the rest of the village did, that there was a security check in progress. Not until the evening of the day it was finished, and after he had announced his departure for London the following day, did he speak much of the day out and its consequences. Then, following a lull in conversation, he said, I've got a proposition to make to you two, if you'd care to hear it. Let's hear it and see, I told him. Essentially it is this. We feel that it is rather important for us to keep an eye on this village for a time, and know what goes on here. We could introduce one of our own men to help keep us posted, but there are points against that. For one thing, he would have to start from scratch, and it takes time for any stranger to work into the life of any village. And for another, it is doubtful whether we could justify the detachment of a good man to full-time work here at present. And if he were not full-time, it is equally doubtful whether he could be of much use. If, on the other hand, we could get someone reliable, who knows the place, and the people, to keep us posted on possible developments, it would be more satisfactory all round. What do you think? I considered for a moment. Not at first hearing very much, I told him. It rather depends, I suppose, what's involved. I glanced across at Janet. She said somewhat coldly, It rather sounds as if we're being invited to spy on our friends and neighbours. I think perhaps a professional spy might suit you better. This, I backed her up, is our home. He nodded, rather as if that were what he had expected. You consider yourselves a part of this community, he said. We're trying to be, and, I think, beginning to be, I told him. He nodded again. Good. At least good if you feel that you have begun to have an obligation towards it. That's what's needed. It can well do with someone who has its welfare at heart to keep an eye on it. I don't see quite why. It seems to have got along very well without for a number of centuries. Or at least should I say that the attentions of its own inhabitants have served it well enough. Yes, he admitted, true enough, until now. Now, however, it needs and is getting some outside protection. It seems to me that the best chance of giving it that protection depends quite largely on our having adequate information on what goes on inside it. What sort of protection? And from what? Well, chiefly at present from busybodies, he said. My dear fellow, surely you don't think it was an accident that the midwitch day out wasn't splashed across the papers on the day out, or that there wasn't a rush of journalists of all kinds pestering the life out of everyone here the moment it lifted? Well, of course not, I said. Naturally, I knew there was a security angle. You told me as much yourself, and I was not surprised at that. I don't know what goes on at the Grange, but I do know it's very hush. It wasn't simply the Grange that was put to sleep, he pointed out. It was everything for a mile around. But it included the Grange. That must have been the focal point. Quite possibly the influence, whatever it was, doesn't have less than that range. Or perhaps the people, whoever they were, thought it safer to have that much elbow room for safety. That's what the village thinks? he asked. Well, most of it, with a few variations. Well, that's the sort of thing I want to know. They all pin it on the Grange, do they? Well, naturally, what other reason could there be? In Midwich. Well, then... Suppose I tell you I have reason to believe that the Grange had nothing whatever to do with it, and that our very careful investigations do no more than confirm that. But that would make nonsense of the whole thing, I protested. Surely not. Not, that is, any more than any accident can be regarded as a form of nonsense. Accident? You mean a forced landing? Bernard shrugged. That I can't tell you. It's possible that the accident lay more in the fact that the Grange happened to be located where the landing was made, but my point is this. Almost everyone in this village has been exposed to a curious and quite unfamiliar phenomenon. And now you and all the rest of the place are assuming it is over and finished with. Why? Both Janet and I stared at him. Well, she said, it's come and it's gone, so why not? and it simply came, and did nothing, and went away again, and had no effect on anything? I don't know. What, no visible effect, beyond the casualties, of course, and they, mercifully, can't have known anything about it, Janet replied. No visible effect, he repeated. That means rather little nowadays, doesn't it? You can, for instance, have quite a serious dose of X-rays, gamma rays, and others without immediate visible effect. 
You needn't be alarmed. It is just an instance. If any of them had been present, we should have detected them. They were not. But something that we were unable to detect was present. Something quite unknown to us that is capable of inducing, let's call it artificial, sleep. Now that is a very remarkable phenomenon. Quite inexplicable to us and not a little alarming. Do you really think one is justified in airily assuming that such a peculiar incident can just happen and then cease to happen and have no effect? Well, it may be so, of course. It may have no more effect than an aspirin tablet. But surely one should keep an eye on things to see whether that is so or not. Janet weakened a little. You mean you want us or someone to do that for you, to watch for and note any effects? What I'm after is a reliable source of information on Midwich as a whole. I want to be kept posted and up to date on how things are here, so that if it should become necessary to take any steps, I shall be aware of the circumstances and be better able to take them in good time. Now you're making it sound like a kind of welfare work, Janet said. In a way, that's what it is. I want a regular report on Midwich's state of health, mind and morale, so that I can keep a fatherly eye on it. There's no question of spying. I want it so that I can act for Midwich's benefit, should it be necessary. Janet looked at him steadily for a moment. Just what are you expecting to happen here, Bernard? She asked. Would I have to make this suggestion to you if I knew? He countered. I'm taking precautions. We don't know what this thing is or does. We can't slap on a quarantine order without evidence. But we can watch for evidence. At least you can. So what do you say? I'm not sure, I told him. Give us a day or two to think it over, and I'll let you know. Good, he said. And we went on to talk of other things. Janet and I discussed the matter several times in the next few days. Her attitude had modified considerably. He's got something up his sleeve, I'm sure, she said. But what? I did not know. And it isn't as if we were being asked to watch a particular person, is it? I agreed that it was not. And it wouldn't be really different in principle from what a medical officer of health does, would it? Not very different, I thought. And if we don't do it for him, he'll have to find somebody else to do it. I don't really see who he'd get in the village. It wouldn't be very nice or efficient if he did have to introduce a stranger, would it? I suppose not. So, mindful of Miss Ogle's strategic situation in the post office, I wrote, instead of telephoning, to Bernard, telling him that we thought we saw our way clear to cooperation, provided we could be satisfied over one or two details, and received a reply suggesting that we should arrange a meeting when we next came to London. The letter showed no feeling of urgency, and merely asked us to keep our eyes open in the meantime. We did, but there was little for them to perceive. A fortnight after the day out, only very small rumples remained in Midwich's placidity. The small minority who felt that security had cheated them of national fame and pictures in the newspapers had become resigned. The rest were glad that the interruption of their days had been no greater. Another division of local opinion concerned the Grange and its occupants. One school held that the place must have some connection with the event, and but for its mysterious activities, the phenomenon would never have visited Midwich. The other considered its influence as something of a blessing. Mr. Arthur Crim, OBE, the director of the station, was the tenant of one of Zellaby's cottages, and Zellaby, encountering him one day, expressed the majority view that the village was indebted to the researchers. But for your presence and the consequent security interest, he said, we should without doubt have suffered a visitation far worse than that of the day out. Our privacy would have been ravaged, our susceptibilities outraged by the three modern furies, the awful sisterhood of the printed word, the recorded word, and the picture. So against your inconveniences, which I am sure have been considerable, you can at least set our gratitude that the Midwich way of life has been preserved largely intact. Miss Polly Rushton, almost the only visitor to the district to be involved, concluded her holiday with her uncle and aunt and returned home to London. Alan Hughes found himself, to his disgust, not only inexplicably posted to the north of Scotland, but also listed for release several weeks later than he had expected, and was spending much of his time up there in documentary argument with his regimental record office, and most of the rest of it seemingly in correspondence with Miss Selaby. 
Mrs. Harriman, the baker's wife, after thinking up a series of not very convincing circumstances, which could have led to the discovery of Herbert Flagg's body in her front garden, had taken refuge in attack, and was belabouring her husband with the whole of his known and suspected past. Almost everyone else went on as usual. Thus, in three weeks the affair was nearly an historical incident. Even the new tombstones that marked it might, or at any rate, quite half of them might, have been expected so to stand in a short time, from natural causes. The only newly created widow, Mrs. Crankhart, rallied well and showed no intention of letting her state depress her, nor indeed harden. Midwich had, in fact, simply twitched. Curiously, perhaps, but only very slightly, for the third or fourth time in its thousand-year doze. And now I come to a technical difficulty, for this, as I've explained, is not my story, it is Midwich's story. If I were to set down my information in the order it came to me, I should be flitting back and forth in the account, producing an almost incomprehensible hotchpotch of incidents out of order, and effects preceding causes. Therefore, it is necessary that I rearrange my information, disregarding entirely the dates and times when I acquired it, and put it into chronological order. If this method of approach should result in the suggestion of uncanny perception, or disquieting multiscience in the writer, the reader must bear with it the assurance that it is entirely the product of hindsight. It was, for instance, not current observation but later inquiry, which revealed that a little while after the village had seemingly returned to normal, there began to be small swirls of localised uneasiness in its corporative peace, certain disquiets that were, as yet, isolated, and unacknowledged. This would be somewhere about late November, even early December, though perhaps in some quarters slightly earlier. Approximately, that is, about the time that Miss Farrellin's Ellaby mentioned in the course of her almost daily correspondence with Mr. Hughes that a tenuous suspicion had perturbingly solidified. In what appears to have been a not very coherent letter, she explained, or perhaps one should say intimated, that she did not see how it could be. And in fact, according to all she had learned, it couldn't be. So she did not understand it at all. But the fact was that in some mysterious way, she seemed to have started a baby. Well, actually seemed wasn't quite the right word, because she was pretty sure about it, really. So did he think he could manage a weekend leave, because one did rather feel that it was the sort of thing that needed some talking over? Thank you for watching the video. Subscribe to hear more great stories. Chapter 7 Coming Events In point of fact, investigations have shown that Alan was not the first to hear Ferrellin's news. She had been worried and puzzled for some little time, and two or three days before she wrote to him had made up her mind that the time had come for the matter to be known in the family circle. For one thing, she badly needed advice and explanation that none of the books she consulted seemed able to give her, and, for another, it struck her as more dignified than just going on until somebody should guess. Angela, she decided, would be the best person to tell first. Mother, too, of course, but a little later on, when the organising was already done. It looked like one of those occasions when Mother might get terribly executive about everything. Decision, however, had been rather easier to take than action. On the Wednesday morning, Farrellin's mind was fully made up. At some time in the day, some relaxed hour, she would draw Angela quietly aside and explain how things were. Unfortunately, there hadn't seemed to be any part of Wednesday when people were really relaxed. Thursday morning did not feel suitable somehow either, and in the afternoon, Angela had had a Women's Institute meeting, which made her look tired in the evening. There was a moment on Friday afternoon that might have done, and yet it did not seem quite the kind of thing one could raise while Daddy showed his lunch visitor at the garden, preparatory to bringing him back for tea. So what with one thing and another, Ferrellin arose on Saturday morning, with her secret still unshared. I really have to tell her today, even if everything doesn't seem absolutely right for it. A person could go on this way for weeks, she told herself firmly, as she finished dressing. Gordon Zellaby was at the last stage of his breakfast when she reached the table, he accepted her good-morning kiss absent-mindedly and presently took himself off to his routine, once briskly round the garden, then to his study, and the work in progress. Farrellin ate some cornflakes, drank some coffee, and accepted a fried egg and bacon. 
After two nibbles, she pushed the plate away decisively enough to arouse Angela from her reflections. What's the matter? Angela inquired from her end of the table. Isn't it fresh? Oh, there's nothing wrong with it, Farallon told her. I just don't happen to feel eggy this morning, that's all. Angela seemed uninterested. When one had half hoped, she would ask why. An inside voice seemed to prompt Farallon. Why not now? After all, it can't really make much difference when, can it? So she took a breath. By way of introducing the matter gently, she said, As a matter of fact, Angela, I was sick this morning. Oh? Indeed, said her stepmother, and paused while she helped herself to butter. In the act of raising her marmaladed toast, she added, So was I. Horrid, isn't it? Now she had taxied onto the runway, Farallon was going through with it. She squashed the opportunity of diverting forthwith. I think, she said steadily, that mine was rather special kind of being sick. The sort, she added, in order that it should be perfectly clear, that happens when a person might be going to have a baby, if you see what I mean. Angela regarded her for a moment with thoughtful interest and nodded slowly. I do, she agreed. With careful attention, she buttered a further area of toast and added marmalade. Then she looked up again. So was mine, she said. Farallon's mouth fell a little open as she stared. To her astonishment, and to her confusion, she found herself feeling slightly shocked. But, well, after all, why not? Angela was only sixteen years older than herself. So it was all very natural, really, only... Well, somehow one just hadn't expected it. It didn't seem quite... After all, Daddy was a triple grandfather by his first marriage. Besides, it was all so unexpected. It somehow hadn't seemed likely. Not that Angela wasn't a wonderful person, and one was very fond of her, but sort of as a capable elder sister. It needed a bit of readjusting, too. She went on staring at Angela, unable to find the right-sounding thing to say, because everything had somehow turned the wrong way round. Angela was not seeing Farallon. She was looking straight down the table, out of the window, at something much further away than the bare, swaying branches of the chestnut. Her dark eyes were bright and shiny. The shininess increased and sparkled into two drops sparkling on her lower lashes. They welled, overflowed, and ran down Angela's cheeks. A kind of paralysis still held Farallon. She'd never seen Angela cry. Angela wasn't that kind of person. Angela bent forward and put her face in her hands. Farallon jumped up, as if she had been suddenly released. She ran to Angela, put her arms round her, and felt her trembling. She held her close and stroked her hair, and made small comforting sounds. In the pause that followed, Farallon could not help feeling that a curious element of miscasting had intruded. It was not an exact reversal of roles, for she had had no intention of weeping on Angela's shoulder, but it was near enough to it to make one wonder if one were fully awake. Quite soon, however, Angela ceased to shake. She drew longer, calmer breaths and presently sought for a handkerchief. Phew! she said. Sorry to be such a fool. I'm so happy. Oh, Farron responded uncertainly. Angela blew, blinked, and dabbed. You see, she explained, I've not really dared to believe it myself. Telling it to somebody else suddenly made it real. And I've always wanted to, so much, you see. But then nothing happened, and went on not happening. So I began to think, well, I'd just about decided I'd have to try to forget about it and make the best of things. And now it's really happening, after all, I... I... She began to weep again, quietly and comfortably. A few minutes later, 
She pulled herself together, gave a final pat with the bunched handkerchief and decisively put it away. There, she said. That's over. I never thought I was one to enjoy a good cry, but it does seem to help. She looked at Farallon. Makes one thoroughly selfish, too. I'm sorry, my dear. Oh, that's all right. I'm glad for you, Farallon said. Generously, she thought, because after all one had been a bit anticlimaxed. After a pause, she went on. Actually, I don't feel very weepy about it myself, but I do feel a bit frightened. The word caught Angela's attention and dragged her thoughts from self-contemplation. It was not a response she expected from Farallon. She looked at her stepdaughter for a thoughtful moment, as if the full import of the situation were only just reaching her. Frightened, my dear, she repeated. I don't think you need feel that. It isn't very proper, of course, but, well, we shan't get anywhere by being puritanical about it. The first thing to do is make sure you're right. I am right, Farallon said gloomily, but I don't understand it. It's different for you, being married and so on. Angela disregarded that. She went on, well, then the next thing must be to let Alan know. Yes, I suppose so agreed Farallon, without eagerness. Of course it is. And you don't need to be frightened of that. Alan won't let you down. He adores you. Are you sure of that, Angela? Doubtfully. Why, yes, you silly. One only has to look at him. Of course, it's all quite reprehensible, but I shouldn't be surprised if you find he's delighted. Naturally, it will... Why, Farallon, what's the matter? She broke off, startled by Farallon's expression. But you don't understand, Angela. It wasn't Alan. The look of sympathy died from Angela's face. Her expression went cold. She started to get up. No! exclaimed Farallon desperately. You don't understand, Angela. It isn't that. It wasn't anybody. That's why I'm frightened. In the course of the next fortnight, three of the midwitch young women sought confidential interviews with Mr. Leabody. He had baptized them when they were babies. He knew them and their parents well. All of them were good, intelligent, and certainly not ignorant girls. Yet each of them told him, in effect, It wasn't anybody, Vicar. That's why I'm frightened. When Harriman, the baker, chanced to hear that his wife had been to see the doctor, he remembered that Herbert Flagg's body had been found in his front garden, and he beat her up. While she tearfully protested that Herbert hadn't come in, and that she'd not had anything to do with him, or with any other man. Young Tom Dory returned home on leave from the Navy after eighteen months foreign service. When he learned of his wife's condition, he picked up his traps and went over to his mother's cottage. But she told him to go back and stand by the girl, because she was frightened. And when that didn't move him, she told him that she herself, respectable widow for years, was, well, not exactly frightened, but she couldn't for the life of her say how it had happened. In a bemused state, Tom Dory did go back. He found his wife lying on the kitchen floor with an empty aspirin bottle beside her, and he pelted for the doctor. One not-so-young woman suddenly bought a bicycle and pedalled it madly for astonishing distances with fierce determination. Two young women collapsed in overhot baths. Three inexplicably tripped and fell downstairs. A number suffered from unusual gastric upsets. Even Miss Ockle at the post office was observed eating a curious meal which involved bloater paste spread half an inch thick and about half a pound of pickled gherkins. A point was reached when Dr. Willer's mounting anxiety drove him into urgent conference with Mr. Leabody at the vicarage, and, as if to underline the need for action, their talk was terminated by a caller in agitated need of the doctor. It turned out less badly than it might have done. Luckily, the word poison appeared on the disinfectant bottle in conformity with the regulations, and was not to be taken as literally as Rosie Platch had thought. But that did not alter the tragic intention. When he had finished, Dr. Willis was trembling with an impotent, targetless anger. Poor little Rosie Platch was only seventeen. Thank you for watching the video. Subscribe to hear more great stories. Chapter 8 Heads Together the tranquillity that Gordon Zellaby had been pleasantly regaining after the wedding of Alan and Farallon two days before was dissipated by the eruption of Dr. Willers. 
The doctor, still upset by the near tragedy of Rosie Platch, was in an agitated state which gave Zellaby some difficulty in grasping his purpose. By stages, however, he discovered that the doctor and the vicar had agreed to ask for his help, or, more importantly, it seemed, Angela's help, over something that was far from clear, and that the misadventure to the Platch child had brought Willers on his mission earlier than he had intended. So far we've been lucky, Willers said, but this is a second attempted suicide in a week. At any moment there may be another, perhaps a successful one. We must get this thing out in the open and relieve the tension. We cannot afford any more delay. As far as I'm concerned, it's certainly not in the open. What thing is this? inquired Zellaby. Willis stared at him for a moment, and then rubbed his forehead. Sorry, he said. I've been so wound up with it lately, I forgot you might know. It's all these inexplicable pregnancies. Inexplicable? Zellaby raised his eyebrows. Willis did his best to explain why they were inexplicable. Well, the whole thing is so incomprehensible, he concluded, that the vicar and I have been driven back onto the theory that it must in some way be connected with the other incomprehensible thing we have had here, the day out. Zellaby regarded him thoughtfully for several moments. One thing about which there could be no doubt at all was the genuineness of the doctor's anxiety. It seems a curious theory, he suggested, cautiously. It's a more than curious situation, replied Willers. However, that can wait. What can't wait is a lot of women who are on the verge of hysteria. Some of them are my patients, and more of them are going to be, and unless this state of tension is resolved quickly. He left the sentence unfinished with a shake of his head. A lot of women, repeated Zellaby. Well, somewhat vague. How many? I can't say for certain, Willers admitted. Well, in round figures. We need some idea of what we have to deal with. I should say, oh, about sixty-five to seventy. What? Zellaby stared at him incredulously. I told you it is the devil of a problem. But if you're not sure, why pitch on sixty-five? Because that's my estimate. It's a pretty rough estimate, I admit, but I think you'll find that it's about the number of women of childbearing age in the village, Willis told him. Later that evening, after Angela Zellaby, looking tired and shocked, had gone to bed, Willis said, I'm very sorry to have had to inflict this, Zellaby, but she would have had to know soon, in any case. My hope is that the others can take it only half as staunchly as your wife has. Zellaby gave a sombre nod. Oh, she is grand, isn't she? I wonder how you or I would have stood up to a shock like that. It's a hell of a thing, Willis agreed. So far, most of the married women will have been easy in their minds, but now, in order to stop the unmarried going neurotic, we're going to have to upset them too. But there's no way around that that I can see. One thing that's been worrying me all the evening is how much we ought to tell them, Celebi said. I mean, should we leave the thing a mystery and let them draw conclusions eventually for themselves, or is there a better way? Well, damn it, it is a mystery, isn't it? The doctor pointed out. The how is a very mysterious mystery, Selby admitted, but I don't think that there can be much doubt as to what has happened, nor, I imagine, do you, unless you're deliberately trying to avoid it. You tell me, suggested Willis. Your line of reasoning may be different. I hope it is. Zellaby shook his head. The conclusion, he began, and then suddenly broke off, staring at the picture of his daughter. My God, he exclaimed. Ferelin, too. He turned his head slowly towards the doctor. I suppose the answer is that you just don't know. Willis hesitated. I can't be sure, he said. Zellaby pushed back his white hair and lapsed back in his chair. He remained staring at the pattern of the carpet for a full minute in silence. Then he roused himself. With a studied detachment of manner, he observed, There are three, um, no, perhaps four, possibilities that suggest themselves. You would, I think, have mentioned it, had there been any evidence of the explanation that will at once occur to the more obvious-minded. Besides, there are other points against that which I will come to shortly. Quite so, agreed the doctor. Zellaby nodded. Then it is possible, is it not, in some of the lower forms at any rate, to induce parthenogenesis. But not, as far as is known, among any of the higher forms, certainly not among mammals. Quite. 
Well, then, there is artificial insemination. There is, admitted the doctor. But you don't think so? I don't. Nor do I. And that, Zellaby went on a little grimly, leaves the possibility of implantation, which could result in what someone, Huxley, I think, has called xenogenesis. That is, the production of a form uh, that could be unlike that of the parent. Or should one perhaps say host? It would not be the true parent. Dr. Willers frowned. I have been hoping that that might not occur to them, he said. Zellaby shook his head. I hope, my dear fellow, that you would do better to abandon. It may not occur to them straight away, but it is the explanation, if that is not too definite a word, that the intelligent ones are bound to arrive at before long. For, for look here, we can agree, can we not, to dismiss parthenogenesis. There has never been a reliably documented case. The doctor nodded. Well, then, it will soon become as clear to them as it is to me, and must be to you, that both crude assault and AI are put right out of court by sheer mathematics. And this, incidentally, would seem to apply to parthenogenesis, too, if that were possible. By the law of averages, it is simply not possible in any sizable group of women taken at random for more than 25% of them to be in the same stage of pregnancy at the same time. Well, began the doctor doubtfully, all right, uh, let us make a concession to say 33 and a third percent, which is high. But then, if your estimate of the incidence is right, or anywhere near right, the present situation is still statistically quite impossible. Ergo, whether we like it or not, we are thrown back upon the fourth and last possibility, that implantation of fertilized ova must have taken place during the day out. Willers was looking very unhappy, and still not altogether convinced. I'd question your and last. There could be other possibilities that have not occurred to us. With a touch of impatience, Zellaby said, Can you suggest any form of conception that does not come up against that mathematical barrier? No? Very well. Then it follows that this cannot be conception, therefore it must be incubation. The doctor sighed. All right, I'll grant you that, he said. For myself, I am only incidentally concerned about how it happened. My anxiety is for the welfare of those who are, and are going to be, my patients. You will be concerned later on, Zillaby put in, because since they are all at the same stage now, it follows that the births are going to occur, barring accidents, over a quite limited period later on, all round about the end of June or the first week of July, everything else being normal, of course. At present... Willows continued firmly. My chief worry is to decrease their anxiety, not to increase it. And for that reason, we must do our best to stop this implantation idea getting about for as long as we can. It's panicky stuff. For their good, I ask you to poo-poo convincingly any suggestion of the kind that may come your way. Yes, agreed Zellaby, after consideration. Yes, I agree. Here, we really do have a case for benign censorship, I think. He frowned. It's difficult to appreciate how a woman sees these matters. All that I can say is that if I were to be called upon, even in the most propitious circumstances, to bring forth life, the prospect would awe me considerably. Had I any reason to suspect that it might be some unexpected form of life, I should probably go quite mad. Most women wouldn't, of course. They are mentally tougher. But some might. So a convincing dismissal of the possibility will be best. He paused, considering... Now we ought to get down to giving my wife a line to work on. There are various angles to be covered. One of the most tricky is going to be publicity, or rather, no publicity. Lord, yes, said Willis. Once the press get hold of it. I know. God help us if they do. Day by day commentary with six months of gloriously mounting speculation to go. They certainly wouldn't miss the xenogenesis angle. More likely to run a forecasting competition... All right, then. M.I. managed to keep the day out out of the papers. We'll have to see what they can do about this. Now, let's rough out the approach for her. Thank you for watching the video. Subscribe to hear more great stories. Chapter 9. Keep It Dark the canvassing for attendance at what was not very informatively described as a special emergency meeting of great importance to every woman in Midwich was intensive. 
We ourselves were visited by Gordon Zellaby, who managed to convey a quite dramatic sense of urgency through a considerable wordage, which gave practically nothing away. His parrying of attempts to pump him only added to the interest. Once people had been convinced that it was not simply a matter of another civil defence drive, or any other of the hardy regulars, they developed a strong curiosity as to what it could possibly be that could put the doctor, the vicar, their wives, the district nurse, and both the Zellabies, too, to the trouble of seeing that everyone was called on and given a special invitation. The very evasiveness of the callers, backed by their reassurances that there would be nothing to pay, no collection, and a free tea for all, had caused inquisitiveness to triumph even in the naturally suspicious, and there were few empty seats. The two chief conveners sat on the platform with Angela Zellaby, looking a little pale between them. The doctor smoked with a nervous intensity. The vicar seemed lost in an abstraction from which he would rouse himself now and then to make a remark to Mrs. Zellaby, who responded to it with an absent-minded air. They allowed ten minutes for laggards. Then the doctor asked for the doors to be closed, and opened the proceedings with a brief but still uninformative insistence on their importance. The vicar then added his support. He concluded, I earnestly ask every one of you here to listen very carefully, indeed, to what Mrs. Zellaby has to say. We are greatly indebted to her for her willingness to put the matter before you. And I want you to know in advance that she has the endorsement of Dr. Willers and myself for everything she is going to tell you. It is, I assure you, only because we feel that this matter may come more acceptably, and, I am sure, more ably, from a woman to women, that we have burdened her with the task. Dr. Willis and I will now leave the hall, but we shall remain on the premises. When Mrs. Ellaby has finished, we shall, if you wish, return to the platform and do our best to answer questions. And now I ask you to give Mrs. Ellaby your closest attention. He waved the doctor ahead of him, and they both went out by a door at the side of the platform. It swung to behind them, but did not close entirely. Angela Zellaby drank from a glass of water on the table before her. She looked down for a moment at her hands resting on her notes. Then she raised her head, waiting for the murmurs to die down. When they had, she looked her audience over carefully, as if noticing every face there. First, she said, I must warn you. What I have to tell you is going to be difficult for me to say. Difficult for you to believe? Too difficult for any of us to understand at present. She paused, dropped her eyes, then looked up once more. I, she said, am going to have a baby. I am very, very glad and happy about it. It is natural for women to want babies and to be happy when they know they are coming. It is not natural, and it is not good, to be afraid of them. Babies should be joy and fun. Unhappily, there are a number of women in Midwich who are not able to feel like that. Some of them are miserable, ashamed, and afraid. It is for their benefit we have called this meeting, to help the unhappy ones, and to assure them that they need be none of these things. She looked steadily round her audience again. There was sound of caught breath here and there. Something very, very strange has happened here. And it has not just happened to one or two of us, but to almost all of us, to almost all the women in Midwich who are capable of bearing children. The audience sat motionless and silent, every eye fixed upon her as she put the situation before them. Before she had finished, however, she became aware of some disturbance and shushing going on on the right-hand side of the hall. Glancing over there, she saw Miss Latterly, and her inseparable companion, Miss Lamb, in the middle of it. Angela stopped speaking in mid-sentence and waited. She could hear the indignant tone of Miss Latterly's voice, but not its words. Miss Latterly, she said clearly, am I right in thinking that you do not find yourself personally concerned with the subject of this meeting? Miss Latterly stood up. She spoke in a voice trembling with indignation. You most certainly are, Mrs. Zellaby. I have never in all my life. Then, since this is a matter of the gravest importance to many people here, I hope you will refrain from further interruptions, or perhaps you would prefer to leave us. 
Miss Latterly stood firm, looking back at Mrs. Zellaby. This is... she began, and then changed her mind. Very well, Mrs. Zellaby, she said. I shall make my protest against the extraordinary aspersions you have made on our community at another time. She turned with dignity and paused, clearly to allow Miss Lamb to accompany her exit. But Miss Lamb did not move. Miss Latterly looked down at her, with an impatient frown. Miss Lamb continued to sit fast. Miss Latterly opened her lips to speak, but something in Miss Lamb's expression checked her. Miss Lamb ceased to meet her eyes. She looked straight before her, while a tide of colour rose until her whole face was a burning flush. An odd, small sound escaped from Miss Latterly. She put out a hand and grasped a chair to steady herself. She stared down at her friend without speaking. In a few seconds she grew haggard and looked ten years older. Her hand dropped from the chair back. With a great effort she pulled herself together. She lifted her head decisively, looking round with eyes that seemed to see nothing. Then, straight-backed, but a little uncertain in her steps, she made her way up the aisle to the back of the hall, alone. Angela waited. She expected a buzz of comment, but there was none. The audience looked shocked and bewildered. Every face turned back to her, in expectation. In the silence she picked up where she had stopped. Trying to reduce, by matter-of-factness, the emotional tension which Miss Latterly had increased. With an effort she continued factually to the end of her preliminary statement, and then broke off. The expected buzz of comment rose quickly enough this time. Angela took a drink from her glass of water and rolled her bunched handkerchief between her damp palms while she watched the audience carefully. She could see Miss Lamb leaning forward with a handkerchief pressed to her eyes, while kindly Mrs. Brant, beside her, tried to comfort her. Nor was Miss Lamb by any means the only one finding relief in tears. Over those bent heads the sound of voices, incredulous, high-pitched with consternation and indignation, grew. Here and there one or two were behaving a little hysterically, but there was nothing like the outburst she had feared. She wondered to what extent an inkling awareness had blunted the shock. With a feeling of relief and rising confidence, she went on observing them for several minutes. When she decided that the first impact had had long enough to register, she rapped the table. The murmurs died away. There were a few sniffs, and then rows of expectant faces turned towards her once more. Angela took a deep breath and started in again. Nobody, she said, nobody but a child, or a child-minded person, expects life to be fair. It is not, and this is going to be harder on some of us than on others. Nevertheless, fair or unfair, whether we like it or not, we are all of us, married and single alike, in the same boat. There is no ground for, and consequently no place for, disparagement of some of us by others. All of us have been placed outside the conventions, and if any married woman here is tempted to consider herself more virtuous than her unmarried neighbour, she might do well to consider how, if she were challenged, she could prove that the child she now carries is her husband's child. This is a thing that has happened to all of us. We must make it bind us together for the good of all. There is no blame upon any of us, so there must be no differentiation between us except— She paused, and then repeated, Except that those— who have not the love of a husband to help them, will have more need of our sympathy and care. She continued to elaborate that for a while until she hoped it had made its mark. Then she turned to another aspect. This, she told them forcefully, is our affair. There could not well be any matter more personal to each of us. I am sure, and I think you will agree with me, that it should remain so. It is for us to handle ourselves, without outside interference. You must all know how the cheap papers seize upon anything to do with birth, particularly anything unusual. They make a peep show of it, as if the people concerned were freaks and affair. The parents' lives, their homes, their children are no longer their own. We have all read of one instance of a multiple birth where the papers took it up, then the medical profession, backed by the government, with the result that the parents were virtually deprived of their own children quite soon after they were born. 
Well, I for one do not intend to lose my child that way, and I expect and hope that all of you will feel the same. Therefore, unless we want to have first a great deal of unpleasantness, for I warn you that if this should become generally known, it will be argued in every club and pub, with a great many nasty insinuations. Unless then we want to be exposed to that, and then to the very real probability that our babies will be taken away from us. On one excuse or another, by doctors and scientists, we must, every one of us, resolve not to mention, or even hint, outside the village at the present state of affairs. It is in our power to see that it remains Midwich's affair, to be managed, not as some newspaper or ministry decides, but as the people of Midwich themselves wish it decided. If people in train or elsewhere are inquisitive, or strangers come here asking questions, we must, for our baby's sake and our own, tell them nothing. But we must not simply be silent and secretive, as if we were concealing something. We must make it seem that there is nothing unusual in Midwich at all. If we all cooperate, and our men are made to understand that they must cooperate too, no interest will be aroused, and people will leave us alone, as they should do. It is not their business; it is ours. There is no one, no one at all, who has a better right or a higher duty to protect our children from exploitation than we, who are to be their mothers. She surveyed them steadily, almost individually once more, as she had at the start. Then she concluded, "I shall now ask the vicar and Doctor Willers to come back. If you will excuse me for a few minutes, I will join them here later." I know there must be a great many questions you are wanting to ask. She slipped off into the little room at the side. Excellent, Mrs. Ellaby, really excellent," said Mr. Leabody. Doctor Willers took her hand and pressed it. "I think you've done it, my dear," he told her as he followed the vicar onto the platform. Ellaby guided her to a chair. She sat down and leant back with her eyes closed. Her face was pale and she looked exhausted. I think you'd better come home," he told her. She shook her head. "No, I'll be all right in a few minutes. I must go back. They can manage. You've done your part and very well too." She shook her head again. "I know what those women must be feeling. This is absolutely crucial, Gordon. We've got to let them ask questions and talk, talk as long as they like. Then they'll have got over the first shock by the time they go. They've got to get used to the idea. A feeling of mutual support is what they need. I know. I want it too." She put a hand to her head, and pushed back her hair. You know, it isn't true, Gordon. What I said just now. Which part, my dear? You said a lot, you know, about my being glad and happy. Two days ago, it was quite, quite true. I wanted the baby, yours and mine, so very much. Now I'm frightened about it. I'm frightened, Gordon. He tightened his arm round her shoulders. She rested her head against his with a sigh. "My dear, my dear," he said, stroking her hair gently. "It's going to be all right. We'll look after you." "Not to know!" she exclaimed. "To know there's something growing there, and not to be sure how or what. It's so, so abasing, Gordon. It makes me feel like an animal." He kissed her cheek softly and went on stroking her hair. You're not to worry," he told her. "I'm prepared to bet that when he or she comes, you'll take one look and say, 'Oh dear, there's that Zellaby nose.' <laughs> But if not, we'll face it together. You're not alone, my dear. You must never feel that you are alone. I'm here, and Willis is here. We're here to help you always, all the time." She turned her head and kissed him. "Gordon, darling," she said, and then she pulled away and sat up. I must get back," she announced. Zellaby gazed after her a moment. Then he moved a chair closer to the unclosed door, lit a cigarette, and settled himself to listen critically to the mood of the village as it showed in its questions. Thank you for watching the video. Subscribe to hear more great stories. Chapter Ten, Midwich comes to terms. The task for January was to cushion the shock and steer the reactions, and thus to establish an attitude. The initiation meeting could be considered a success. 
it let the air in and a lot of anxiety out, and the audience, tackled while it was still in a semi-stunned condition, had for the most part accepted the suggestion of communal solidarity and responsibility. It was only to be expected that a few individuals should hold aloof, but they were no more anxious than the rest to have their private lives invaded and exposed, and their roads jammed with motor coaches while goggling loads of sightseers peered in at their windows. Moreover, it was not difficult for the two or three who hankered for limelight to perceive that the village was in a mood to subdue any active non-cooperator by boycott. And if Mr. Wilfred Williams thought a little wistfully at times of the trade that might have come to the scythe and stone, he proved a staunch supporter and sensitive to the requirements of longer-term goodwill. Once the bewilderment of the first impact had been succeeded by the feeling that there were capable hands at the helm, when the pendulum swing among the young unmarried women from frightened wretchedness to smug bumptiousness had settled down, and when an air of readiness to turn to, not vastly dissimilar, from that which preceded the annual fete and flower show, began to be apparent, the self-appointed committee could feel that at least it had succeeded in getting things onto the right lines. The original committee of the Willers, the Lee Bodies, the Zellabies and Nurse Daniels had been augmented by ourselves and also by Mr. Arthur Crim, who had been co-opted to represent the interests of several indignant researchers at the Grange, who now found themselves embroiled willy-nilly in the domestic life of Midwich. But though the feeling at the committee meeting held some five days after the village hall meeting could be fairly summarised as, so far so good, members were well aware that the achievement could not be left to take care of itself. The attitude that had been successfully induced might, it was felt, slip back all too easily into normal conventional prejudices, if it were not carefully tended. For some time, at least, it would have to be sustained and fortified. What we need to produce... Angela summed up, is something like the companionship of adversity, but without suggesting that it is an adversity, which, indeed, as far as we know, it is not. The sentiment gained the approval of everyone but Mrs. Leabody, who looked doubtful. But, she said hesitantly, I think we ought to be honest, you know. The rest of us looked at her inquiringly. She went on, Well, I mean, it is an adversity, isn't it? After all, a thing like this wouldn't happen to us for no reason, would it? There must be a reason. So isn't it our duty to search for it? Angela regarded her with a small, puzzled frown. I don't think I quite understand, she said. Well, explained Mrs. Leabody, when things, unusual things like this, suddenly happen to a community, there is a reason. I mean, look at the plagues of Egypt and Sodom and Gomorrah and that kind of thing. There was a pause. Zellaby felt impelled to relieve the awkwardness. Well, for my part, he observed, I regard the plagues of Egypt as an unedifying example of celestial bullying, a technique now known as power politics. As for Sodom, he broke off and subsided as he caught his wife's eye. Ah, uh, said the vicar, since something seemed to be expected of him. Ah, uh, Angela came to his rescue. I really don't think you need to worry about that, Mrs. Leabody. Barrenness is, of course, a classical form of curse, but I really can't remember any instance where retribution took the form of fruitfulness. After all, it scarcely seems reasonable, does it? That would depend on the fruit, Mrs. Leabody said darkly. Another uneasy silence followed. Everybody, except Mr. Leabody, regarded Mrs. Leabody. Dr. Willer's eyes swivelled to catch those of Nurse Daniel's, and then went back to Dora Leabody, who showed no discomfort at being the centre of attention. She glanced round at all of us in an apologetic manner. I am sorry, but I'm afraid I'm the cause of it all, she confided. Uh, Mrs. Leabody, the doctor began. She raised her hand reprovingly. You are kind, she said. I know you want to spare me, but there is a time for confession. I am a sinner, you see. If I... Had had my child twelve years ago, none of this would have happened. Now I must pay for my sin by bearing a child that is not my husband's. It's all quite clear. I am very sorry to have brought this down on the rest of you, but it is a judgment, you see, just like the plagues. The vicar, flushed and troubled, broke in before she could continue. I think, uh, perhaps if you will excuse us, 
There was a general pushing back of chairs. Nurse Daniels crossed quietly to Mrs. Leabody's side and began a conversation with her. Dr. Willis watched them for a moment until he became aware of Mr. Leabody beside him, mutely inquiring. He laid a hand reassuringly on the vicar's shoulder. There has been a shock to her. Not surprising at all. I fully expected a number of cases before this. I'll get Nurse Daniels to see her home and give her a sedative. Very likely a good sleep will make all the difference. I'll look in tomorrow morning. A few minutes later we dispersed, in a subdued and thoughtful mood. The policy advocated by Angela Zellaby was carried out with considerable success. The latter part of January saw the introduction of such a programme of social activities and helpful neighbourliness as we felt would only leave the most determined non-cooperators with the isolation, or the time, to brood. In late February I was able to report to Bernard that things were going, on the whole, smoothly, more smoothly at any rate than we had dared to hope at first. There had been a few sags in the graph of local confidence, and would doubtless be others, but so far recoveries had been speedy. I gave him details of the happenings in the village since my last report, but information regarding the attitude and views prevailing at the Grange, which he had asked for, I could not supply. Either the researchers were of the opinion that the affair somehow came within the compass of their oaths of secrecy, or else they were of the opinion that it was safer to act as if it did. Mr. Crim continued to be their only link with the village, and it seemed to me that to get any more information, I must either have authority to reveal to him the official nature of my interest, or Bernard would have to tackle him himself. Bernard preferred the latter course, and a meeting was arranged for Mr. Crim's next visit to London. He called in on us on the way back, feeling at liberty to spill some of his troubles, which seemed to be largely concerned with his establishment's section. They do so worship tidiness, he complained. I just don't know what we're going to do when my six problems start to raise matters of allowances and absences and make an undistinguishable mess of their nice tidy leave rosters. And then, too, there'll be the effect on our work schedule. I put it to Colonel Westcott that if his department really is seriously concerned to keep the matter quiet, they'll only be able to do it by stepping in officially, at high level. Otherwise, we shall have to give explanations before long. I think he sees my point there. But for the life of me, I can't see why that particular aspect should be of such interest to M.I. Can you? Now, that is a pity, Janet told him. One of our hopes when we heard that you were going to see him was that you might learn enough to enlighten us. Life appeared to be going on smoothly enough in Midwich for the present, but it was only a little later that one of the undercurrents broke surface and gave us a flutter of anxiety. After the committee meeting, which she had brought to a premature close, Mrs. Leabody ceased, not altogether surprisingly, to play any further active part in the promotion of village harmony. When she did reappear, after a few days' rest, she seemed to have recovered her balance by a decision to regard the whole unfortunate situation as a distasteful subject. On one of the early days in March, however, the vicar of St. Mary's in train, accompanied by his wife, brought her home in their car. They found her, he reported to Mr. Leabody with some embarrassment, preaching in train market from an upturned box. Ah, uh, preaching? said Mr. Leabody, a new uneasiness mingling with his concern. I, er, uh, can you tell me what about? Oh, well, well, quite fantastical, I'm afraid, the vicar of St. Mary's told him evasively. But I think I ought to know. The doctor will be sure to ask about it when he arrives. Well, er, uh, it was in the nature of a call to repentance, on a note of, uh, revivalist doom. The people of Train must repent and pray forgiveness for fear of wrath, retribution and hellfire. Rather non-conformist, I'm afraid. Lurid, you know. And it seems they must particularly avoid having anything to do with the people of Midwich who are already suffering under divine disapproval. If the train people do not take heed and mend their ways, punishment will inevitably descend on them too. Oh, said Mr. Leabody, keeping his tone level. She did not say what form our suffering here is taking? A visitation, the vicar of St. Mary's told him. Specifically, the infliction of a plague of, uh, babies. That, of course, was causing some degree of ribaldry. 
a lamentable business altogether. Of course, once my wife had drawn my attention to Mrs. Leabody's, uh, condition, the matter became more intelligible, uh, though still more distressing. I... Oh, here is Dr. Willis now, he broke off with relief. A week later, in the middle of the afternoon, Mrs. Leabody took up a position on the lowest step of the war memorial and began to speak. She was dressed for the occasion in a garment of hessian. Her feet were bare, and there was a smudge of ash on her forehead. Fortunately, there were not many people about at the time, and she was persuaded home again by Mrs. Brandt before she had well begun. Word was all round the village in an hour, but her message, whatever it may have been, remained undelivered. Midwich heard the quickly following news of Dr. Willer's recommendation to rest in a nursing home with sympathy rather than surprise. About mid-March, Alan and Ferrelin made their first visit since their marriage. With Ferrelin putting in time until Alan's release in a small Scottish town entirely among strangers, Angela had been against causing her worry by attempting to explain the Midwich state of affairs in a letter. So now it had to be laid before them. Alan's expression of concern deepened as the predicament was explained. Ferrelin listened without interruption, but with a swift glance now and then at Alan's face. It was she who broke the silence that followed. You know, she said, I had a sort of feeling all along that there was something funny. I mean, it oughtn't... She broke off, struck apparently by an ancillary thought. Oh, how dreadful. I kind of shotgunned poor Alan. This probably makes it coercion or undue influence or something heinous. Could it be grounds for divorce? Oh, dear, do you want a divorce, darling? Zellaby's eyes crinkled a little at the corners as he watched his daughter. Alan put his hand over hers. I think we ought to wait a bit, don't you? He told her. Darling, said Ferrelin, twining her fingers in his. Turning her head after a long look at him, she caught her father's expression. Treating him to a determinedly unresponsive look, she turned to Angela and asked for more details of the village's reactions. Half an hour later they went out, leaving the two men alone together. Alan barely waited for the door to latch before he broke out. I say, sir, this is a bit of a facer, isn't it? Yeah, I'm afraid it is, Zillaby agreed. The best consolation I can offer is that we find the shock wears off. The most painful part is the opening assault on one's prejudices. I speak for our sex, of course. For the women, that is, unfortunately, only the first hurdle. Alan shook his head. This is going to be a terrible blow for Farrellin, I'm afraid. As it must have been to Angela, he added a little hurriedly. Of course, one can't expect her, Farrellin, I mean, to take in all the implications at once. A thing like this needs a bit of absorbing. My dear fellow, said Zellaby. As Farrellin's husband, you have the right to think all sorts of things about her, but one of the things you must not do, for your own peace of mind, is to underestimate her. Farrellin, I assure you, was way ahead of you. I doubt whether she's missed a trick. She was certainly far enough ahead to move in with a lightweight remark, because she knew that if she seemed worried, you would worry about her. Oh, do you think so? said Alan, a little flatly. I do said Zellaby. Furthermore, it was sensible of her. A fruitlessly worrying male is a nuisance. The best thing he can do is to disguise his worry and stand staunchly by, impersonating a pillar of strength while performing certain practical and organisational services. I offer you the fruit of somewhat intensive experience. Another thing he can do is represent modern knowledge and common sense, but tactfully. You can have no idea of the number of venerable sores, significant signs, old wives' soothes, gypsies' warnings, and general fiddle-faddle that has been thrown up by this in the village lately. We have become a folklorist's treasure chest. Did you know that in our circumstances it is dangerous to walk under a lich gate on a Friday? Practically suicide to wear green? Very unwise indeed to eat seed cake? Are you aware that if a dropped knife or needle sticks point down in the floor, it'll be a boy? <laughs> no, I thought you might not be, but never mind. I am assembling a bouquet of these cauliflowers of human wisdom in the hope that they may keep my publishers quiet. Alan inquired with belated politeness after the progress of the current work. Zellaby sighed sadly. I'm supposed to deliver the final draft of The British Twilight by the end of next month. So far I have written three chapters on this supposedly contemporary study. 
If I could remember what they deal with, I've no doubt I should find them obsolete by now. It ruins a man's concentration to have a crash hanging over his head. What is amazing me as much as anything is that you've managed to keep it quiet. I'd have said you hadn't a chance, Alan told him. I did say it, Zellaby admitted, and I'm still astonished. I think it must be a kind of variant on the Emperor's clothes theme, either that or an inversion of the Hitler big lie, a truth too big to be believed. But, mind you, both Opley and Stouch are saying unneighbourly things about some of us that they've noticed, though they appear to have no idea the real scale. I'm told that there is a theory current in both of them, that we have all been indulging in one of those fine old uninhibited rustic frenzies on Halloween. Anyway, several of the inhabitants almost gather their skirts aside as we pass. I must say that our people have restrained themselves commendably, under some provocation. But do you mean that only a mile or two away they've no idea what's really happened? Alan asked incredulously. I'd not say that. So much as they don't want to believe it, they must have heard fairly fully, I imagine. But they choose to believe that it is all a tale to cover up something more normal, but disgraceful. Willers was right when he said that a kind of self-protective reflex would defend the ordinary man and woman from disquieting beliefs. That is, unless it should get into print. On the word of a newspaper, of course, eighty or ninety percent would swing to the opposite extreme and believe everything. The cynical attitude in the other villages really helps. It means that a newspaper is unlikely to get anything to go on unless it is directly informed by someone inside the village. Internal stresses were worse for the first week or two after our announcement. Several of the husbands were awkward to handle, but once we got it out of their heads that it was some elaborate system of whitewashing or spoofing, and when they discovered that none of the others was in a position to make a butt of them, they became more reasonable and less conventional. The Lamb Latterly breach was mended after a few days, when Miss Latterly got over the shock, and Miss Lamb is now being cosseted with a devotion scarcely to be distinguished from tyranny. Our leading rebel for some time was Tilly. Oh, you must have seen Tilly Forsham, Jodpur's roll neck hacking jacket, dragged hither and thither by the whim of fate in the form of three golden retrievers. She protested indignantly for some time that she would not mind if she happened to like babies. But as she much preferred puppies, the whole thing was particularly hard on her. However, she seems now to have given in, though grudgingly. Zellaby rambled on for a time with anecdotes of the emergency, concluding with the one in which Miss Ogle had been narrowly headed off for making the first payment in her own name for the most resplendent perambulator the train could offer. After a pause, Alan prompted, "You did say that about." Ten who might be expected to be involved actually are not. Yes, and five of those were in the bus on the Opley Road and therefore under observation during the day out. That at least has done something to dispel the idea of a fertilising gas, which some seem to be inclined to adopt as one of the new scientific horrors of our age. Zellaby told him. Thank you for watching the video. Subscribe to hear more great stories.